This Whiskey Lore exclusive interview is brought to you by Whiskey Lore's Travel Guide to Experiencing Kentucky Bourbon. Learn the history and process of making bourbon, get insider tips on how to plan a trip to bourbon country, learn tasting techniques, and then read my detailed 32 Kentucky distillery profiles that will help you craft the perfect itinerary for when you head to the bluegrass state. Just head to whiskey-lore.com slash Kentucky book. Welcome to Whiskey Lore. I'm Drew Hanish. I hope you're enjoying some of this great Old West content that Chris and I are bringing to you. And this was a very interesting situation for me in putting together an episode for Whiskey Lore. Normally, I either hear stories firsthand at distilleries or I actually go visit the cities or places that I'm talking about. But because of this little thing called a pandemic... Unfortunately, I did not get a chance to go to Virginia City, and I felt a little off kilter in presenting this to you without having too much firsthand knowledge. Now, what I did do was I read a book by a woman named Kelly Dixon, and her research was really helpful in trying to figure out more about saloon life in Virginia City because she was taking part in that archaeological dig where they were going through the footprints of some of these former saloons and pulling up all of these really cool artifacts that were telling a story. That was a good bit of information, but again, I didn't feel overly connected. I would say that the closest I came was I went to Genoa, Nevada last year, and while I was there, I got the chance to go to the oldest bar in Nevada, and that was also a place where Mark Twain went, and Teddy Roosevelt went there, and Genoa was the first capital of the Nevada Territory, and its first newspaper was the Territorial Enterprise, where Mark Twain ended up working when it moved to Virginia City. So, by extension, I was sort of close, but I wanted to get a lot closer. So I went ahead and reached out to Virginia City, and the response that I got from Amy DeMuth was fantastic. I mean, she helped me get in touch with the distillery, and she helped me get in touch with a local historian by the name of Ron Gallagher. Now, Ron is just the kind of person that I like to bump into when I'm doing this kind of research. His family has been in Virginia City since the early days of the boomtown in 1861. And Ron was an absolute joy to interview. We did the interview by phone. We talk a little bit about the saloons in here, but we also talk about Virginia City, the bonanza effect on the town, and also the big bonanza effect on the town. Lots of interesting stories in here. His recollections are just the kind of thing that I like to have here on Whiskey Lore. You know, capturing those stories while we can. So I hope you enjoy this interview. And I started off by asking Ron about his earliest recollections of Virginia City. Um, I was born in 1941. I'm, I'm coming toward that magic age of 80. So my earliest um, recollections are probably uh, in the late 40s, uh, um, before uh, B.B. and Clay got there, before it, it became what it is today as a tour, long before Bonanza, I might add. Um, so I remember it as a town that had tourists. And by the way, there were tourists coming to Virginia City in the 1870s during the boom period when the railroad was completed uh, to Reno and then to Virginia City. We had we had tourists coming to see the town because it was so unique. Mm. So tourism isn't brand new to the Comstock. But my earliest recollections were somewhere around Memorial Day. We started to get cars coming in. My folks ran a grocery store, so it was right on the main street. So I watched the cars come in. And... Um, then at June, July, August, got to Labor Day, the town shut down, and it was just a 
little town of about 700 people. Oh, wow. And uh, school uh, had, um, in high school, there were 30 kids. Grammar school, 70 or 80. A lot of us went to school together for 12 years because it was a close-knit community of people that had hung around and been there for a long time. So, as I say, my earliest recollections would be riding the horse with my dad somewhere in 48, 49, 50, and uh, learning to drive and whatever when I was about 10 or 11 back in the good old days. So So did it look like a ghost town at that time? What did uh, C Street look like back then? Well, you know, it's funny because he, the, the liveliest ghost town in the West, uh, to us, it, it was just our town. And there were a lot of buildings that had no businesses in them. They were just storefronts. Um, my folks' store is, was um, almost in the middle of town, kind of at the, at the south end. So it was just Virginia City. It's where we grew up. Uh, you went to the Crystal Bar or you went to the Sazerac Bar and, and I could go in and play the pinball machine or if I got really bored, I could play the nickel slot machine. <laughs> <laughs> I think the statute of limitations is uh, gone. <laughs> yes. Uh, but, and, and, and the Delta, a smokery was there, the Bucket of Blood, some of the, the ones that she mentioned. If you wanted to go somewhere, you went to Carson first and then you went to Reno. So, um uh, it was just a small Nevada town at that point in time. So your family's been there since 1865? My, uh, my mother's side, uh, the Wilsons, as near as I can determine doing some um, ancestry stuff, they got there around 1861, 62. Mm-hmm. My grandfather was born, the house is still there, in 1865. Okay. Uh, and his brother was born in 1864 in that same house. So uh, that's my mother's side. The Gallaghers were newcomers. They didn't get there until about 1871 or 72. <laughs> so, yeah, I have a pretty good uh, thread on the Comstock. So did you have any fun stories that kind of got passed down from uh, generation to generation? I was privy to stories and to buildings and to oyster shells and bottles. We, one of our jokes is that, um, we, we, we grew up shooting things. Uh, one is it was a town where you started with a 22 and you hunted. And then we also were a great basketball town. So you were either shooting hoops or you were shooting guns, (laughs) but probably when I grew up, we could take off, um, didn't think a thing of it, go hunting in the morning and come back and uh, uh, go to school with the gun in the car. Mm. And one of our jokes, I've had this with some of my friends, is we probably, growing up in this little town where you just took off and walked around and it was very centralized, there weren't any outlying houses you had to worry about, we probably shot up a million dollars worth of bottles. Wow. Because there were, if you saw a bottle... It took you 22 to see if you could shoot it. <laughs> and some of those were probably back in those days, if we had known it, they might have been five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 bottles. So wow. that's how we spent our time. Well, it, it, it really was growing up in the Wild West for you then, wasn't it? Well, it was from the standpoint, I guess, yes, in that terminology. But in our case, it was just the way, and by the way, Virginia City, of course, I'm, I'm prejudice is is the greatest industrial mining center in the world and and truly a unique place but not unlike many small towns where kids just it was a different time a different era and guns were part of the culture and you did it right and uh, other towns in in uh, nevada you could go out to austin or you could go to eureka or elko or wherever kids were growing up the same way um not like today, but back in those days, it, it was it was a neat place to grow up. When you watched westerns, you know we get kind of that romantic old west, uh, you know, mm-hmm. feel when we watch a western. Did did you get that same kind of? Do you get that same kind of feel out of watching old westerns, or is it kind of like, eh, you know, I see that every day? Well, actually, when I watch old westerns in the broad term, it's watching a joke to me because Virginia City growing up 
was not a cowboy town. Mm -hmm. Virginia City was a mining town. Now, you had buckaroos, vaqueros uh, down, well, in, you were in Genoa, uh, Carson Valley, Eagle Valley. Virginia City was on the side of a mountain, and when we grew up, cowboys weren't other than to go to the movie yeah. and laugh about Hopalong Cassidy and <laughs> Roy Rogers and all of those. Um, it, we never had a picture that we were in any way a wild west. Everybody had a horse and everybody had a gun. Um, um, it was a mining town, and that's what my mom and dad and, and, and family would talk about. Well, back in the days when and there were there wasn't much mining gro going on when I uh, grew up. Uh, it really all stopped in 1942 when the War Powers Act came in and shut down the couple of mines that were uh, operating. Uh, most of the people, they lived in Virginia City. The stores and the bars were operated by locals. And then a huge number worked for the state of Nevada in Carson City or went to Reno to work for construction companies. Mm. And so we never, when, when Bonanza, what came on in uh, 1958-59, Everybody just chuckled. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It had no, well, we watched Bonanza and enjoyed the show. Don't misunderstand me, but um, it, it had no relevance to Virginia City with the da 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 riding across from Lake Tahoe. We just laughed at that. It was, <laughs> History was, was uh, not being accurately portrayed is basically what you're no, saying. No, and really, when you look at Virginia City today, for those of us that are natives, my view is that I view Bonanza as um, a blessing and a curse mm -hmm. because it put Virginia City on the map from a tourism standpoint, and that's the reincarnation of Virginia City from the greatest industrial mining center in the world to, to a tourist location. Uh, so from that standpoint, people then came in to start businesses. They, they redid storefronts. They've done um, work that held the buildings up that if another 10 years had gone by, they may have fallen down. But by the same token, the the curse part is that Virginia City, with its unique, truly unique history, mm -hmm. um, is kind of lost in the shuffle. So let's talk a little bit about what brought people to Virginia City initially. Was it gold? Was it silver? The and and what is the Comstock Lode? We hear that uh, that term, and some people are probably like, "What what does that mean?" Well, what brought people to Virginia City was the lure of gold. It was the greatest silver mining area in the world, but that isn't what brought them up up the canyons. They were they were placer mining looking for gold flakes when there was enough water to pan. And um, if you look at where Virginia City sits, it's sort of the perfect storm. Uh, California started in 1849. And, of course, all of the people were coming across the country, leaving Carolina, <laughs> leaving New York, to find riches um, uh, in California. And one of the main trails, the Emigrant Trail, mm -hmm. follows what's called the Carson River. Uh, comes through Lovelock, comes across Interstate 80 to some extent. And as people were on that trail they would stop and they were looking for gold and they looked up at what was called Sun Mountain. That's where Virginia City is. And they would go up and pan for gold. The Mormons, by the way, if you were in Genoa, the, that, of course, that was the Mormon community to begin with. They had found traces of gold in the 1850s, long mm -hmm. before 1859. But it was looking for gold that people went up the canyons over the years if they could make $3 a day, which was one ounce of gold that you'd acquire in a week, by the way. That's mm. how you talk about hardworking. $3 a day, <laughs> they thought they were making good money compared to what you were making back in the East Coast. Um, finally, in 59, uh, there was the two gold strikes in that, in that year. Um, and that's what brought people there, but it was the silver that actually... Um, made Virginia City what it was. Okay. Silver far out uh, 
outmine gold in terms of total tonnage and, and value. The Comstock load, because of course it was named after Comstock, and that's a whole story. Mm -hmm. He's not the one that made the original discovery, but his name got attached to it. Comstock load uh, is really uh, the area of Virginia City and Gold Hill, mm -hmm. um, which is probably no more than about uh, five or six miles by two or three miles if you do length and, and, and width. Yeah. And, and so when you say, well, the Comstock load... Normally, that attaches to Virginia City, but it also should attach to Gold Hill, which is, they're virtually side by side, okay. only down the mountain a bit. And there were several mines through this area, correct? Many, many mines, and literally thousands of claims. So how many people were in this town? Because I've heard numbers that have ranged from 15,000 up to, somebody said 85,000. This is getting into a metropolis by that, <laughs> that time. That, that's too high, but uh, <laughs> I guess my answer would be, and I've had that discussion with Ron James, uh, I grew up with, and remember that this is passed down and where my folks got it, Virginia City and Gold Hill had somewhere in the neighborhood of 40,000 people, 25 in Virginia City and 15 in Gold Hill. That is a gross exaggeration in all <laughs> probability because Ron has done the census 1870, 1880. There was a Nevada census in, in mid-1870s. Probably um, Virginia City in the neighborhood of approaching 18, 20,000 mm -hmm. and Gold Hill five, six, seven, so maybe 25,000 total in, in, in the, the big bonanza time, which would have been 1872, 73, 74, 75. But, but if you ever get a chance, and hopefully you'll come out. You have a standing invitation to come. To, Thank you. Uh, Thank I have a bar top from um, the old Virginia Hotel in Virginia City, so you'd love to have a drink. Oh, very nice. I'm sure. Yeah. Put your elbows on it. <laughs> and if I have a couple of drinks, I'll make up some people that I'm sure leaned on it back in the 1800s. But um, it, it, it just a fascinating uh, place and, 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 and time. And uh, we have some pictures where uh, they were taken above Virginia City. And it's, it's literally wall-to-wall -wall buildings, many of them being apartment houses. So there were a lot of people jammed into really a one mile main street, uh, north to south and probably less than that east to west, but lots of people mining drove it, but there were clothing, fine dress shops, uh, multiple, uh, religious, uh, Jewish establishments. It, it was a fascinating multicultural city. And that sometimes gets lost in the, in the, in the translations. Well, it's interesting because we think of a mining town or we think of these little towns that, that popped up all across the West as boom towns and how they were mostly just men and they were coming to do their mining and the town was just kind of thrown up to support the miners and then it would collapse after everything was over. But it sounds like Virginia City actually was like a city. It was probably a lot more men than women, but that there would have been women in the town as well. Well, uh, two things. One is that, that your depiction of a lot of the <clears throat> small mining towns in Nevada, that's pretty accurate. They, they, they were truly boom towns for two, three, four, five years, eight, nine years, maybe. And um, they came and they went. Mm -hmm. The misconception about Virginia City is that well, all the men and all the, the hookers, the ladies of the night, et cetera, et cetera, uh, when it first started out, that's not really correct. And Ron James points that out. And uh, there's also another book I'm giving you reading material. But <laughs> it's called The Bonanza King. It's, it's by a gentleman by the name of Gregory Crouch. And it's the story of John Mackey, who was the richest man in the world, or the second or third, if not the richest as as they point, his uh, Crouch's research uh, points out, and Ron James and and many others. Yes, it was mining guys, uh, hard nosed prospectors, hard working guys. Uh, that that was their job was to find gold. But from the earliest 1860 uh, time frame, after the winter of '59, the discovery, 
there were a lot of miners in there, multiple hundred, mm-hmm. and up to a couple of thousand. But there were also women. But they there were families up there from the very beginning because they had come from Grass Valley and Nevada City, California, and they came across with their husbands, and they brought the children with them. Mm. So the number of of, uh, ladies of the night, they were certainly there, but if, if you read about their history, they didn't just run off to the next mining boom because so many of them fizzled, as we talked about a few minutes ago. And they weren't going to uproot a good business in Grass Valley right. to come to Virginia City. So um, it wasn't until Virginia City got established and the population continued to grow during the 1860s that you really did get a, a kind of a more a, a broader cross section of, of families and more ladies of the night to take care of all those single hardworking miners. Yeah. And so this is what was really interesting about reading Kelly's book is that. You, when you read it, it almost gives you the opposite impression. I, I read a book by a historian named Cy Martin. It was written in the 1970s about brothels and saloons in the Old West. And the way he described them, you didn't have a saloon without having a brothel somewhere nearby, which was kind of the the focus of his book. So that's probably why he gave that impression. But after reading Kelly's book, I got more of an impression that, yes, there were some saloons that had this, but there were other ones that were like uh, old Pipers that was a, a little more upper class or that um, that catered to a different clientele that may not have been as interested in that kind of activity. She was right on because... The idea that that there was a place to go upstairs after a couple of drinks. There were certainly saloons that catered to that. Uh, the Barbary Coast is one of a, an area of, of a couple of blocks that was the original hardcore bad area in Virginia City, probably starting in the late 1860s and 70s. And that's where the the one with the had the shooting gallery in it, mm-hmm. um, and. Uh, that building was still there, by the way, when I was a kid. You asked me about recollections, and I was too damn dumb <laughs> to go down and check out the saloon. Oh, <laughs> it was man. just another abandoned saloon. Uh, who knows what I would have found when the building was still there if I had picked around, and that's where they did one of the digs. But but anyway, uh, the, the perception that, that there was uh, a brothel attached to every, and there were, there were certainly ladies, but they were not all prostitutes that worked in those places, there were also all kinds of small bars that catered to the Irish or catered to the Cornish. Uh, and, and they served food um, to entice the miners to come in. Um, they uh, had a cigar bar. That was uh, big. Uh, some days they s- served champagne and oysters. The, are you familiar with the term the one bit saloon and the two bit saloon? I think she mentioned that in her. She she did mention that, but I forget exactly what the uh, what the connotation was for that. Well, the connotation was if it was a one bit saloon, it was lower priced. Didn't mean mean that it was a, a, just a dump, but and then the two bit saloon was one that had a little better label on the whiskey bottle, yeah. I guess, or served a little uh, better um, food, but. If you look at the number of saloons, and some would say in Gold Hill and Virginia City, it probably approached 80 to 100, and I think that's uh, probably correct. But it was also a town, there was also a population of 20 something thousand. Mm. She also points out, and so does Ron James in his research, that if you looked at the number of people and the number of saloons and what they probably consumed, it really wasn't a whole heck of a lot different than a lot of other cities. Mm. around the country Mm -hmm. it's been glamorized that you know that it was just a hard drink everybody drank and that's not quite correct so well you had some some people as she uh pointed out that um were teetotalers so they weren't going to be drinking whiskey anyway and that they would have alternate drinks for them to enjoy in fact she goes into one thing talking about how some of them would drink bitters not realizing that bitters actually have alcohol in them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, again, Virginia City had the whole 
cross-section of whether you want to compare it to Denver or you want to compare it to San Francisco. It was a marvelous city uh, with all the elements, some very poor people, some Native Americans uh, that were just kind of living on the side of the hill, and some very wealthy uh, folks that uh, were there. So neat, neat, neat place. And, And the bars catered to all of those various groups. Everything from the little neighborhood bar that was mainly Irish to Piper's to the International Hotel, of course, when it was, particularly when it was rebuilt after the fire of 75. So I'd love to go back about 1876, 77 <laughs> and wander around. Yeah. Well, how much of the town burned during the Great Fire? Because there were, as I understand it, there were several fires that occurred in Virginia City, but this one was. Uh, mostly devastating, although it happened in the middle of a boom, so rebuilding wasn't uh, wasn't terribly difficult to do, I guess. Uh, well, you're absolutely correct. There, uh, the, the uh, Steve Frady has written any number of books on fires in Virginia. They call it the Fire Fiend because the fire of seventy five, October seventy five, was the, the biggest fire, and it took out multiple multiple blocks mm. and literally probably hundreds of buildings in one way or another. Uh, so that was the great fire of 75. There were many other fires that took structures, uh, hotels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the fire of 75 um, was the big one, and it took the church. And uh, In fact, part of Virginia City burned and was rebuilt in 75, and that's all still there today. But there are buildings that were built in the 1860s, south of where that fire started, mm-hmm. that are really old Virginia City. When, when you walk up the street, the Warshaw Club being one, um, in her book, the Sazerac or um, the 62 Bar, etc., those go back to the earliest days. In fact, the, the Sazerac, uh, which, which is now... Uh, a, forget the new one, they changed the name. Um, that was uh, the Bank of California building. Oh, that, that, that's the... That uh, building has a history that is amazing. Very, oh, it's the Ponderosa. Ponderosa. Now, why couldn't I think of that? Yeah. <laughs> and it, but it was a Sazerac when I grew up, but it was originally the Bank of California building. And that's where Sharon made his money, etc. And that's a very interesting one because they actually do tours of the mines underneath and there's a bank vault in there still, from what I understand. Yeah, so you've done your homework. Yes. That's an interesting story. It's actually my cousin's husband that put that uh, tunnel in. Mm. And it's absolutely authentic, but of course there was not a tunnel there to begin with. Uh, that was put in in the uh, late 18, or 1960s or 70s. And um, it's a great 150, 200, 250 foot walk. Everything is authentic. Couldn't do that today. <laughs> you <never laughs> by the ocean, uh, whatever. But uh, it was a little easier back there when, and he was uh, son of a son of a miner, uh, Greg. And so he put it in. And there are only two tunnels uh, to go through. That one, which is a, an absolute reincarnation of a real tunnel, and then there's um, one that's open, the Goulden Curry, uh, or no, the, um, oh, come on, Ron, uh, it's below the Fourth Ward School, and that is that goes back um, to the earliest days. That tunnel was there, and there was a huge mill there, and it's open at least during uh, the summer. Okay. So in that area, the mines are, have all basically been closed up and that you don't really get to tour any of the old mines that were there. No, one of the, the great sadnesses, uh, Judy, my, my wife and I have traveled a bit and we've gone up, for example, to Butte, Montana and you go into Butte and there's no question it's a mining town. Now, they're not <laughs> operating now, but there are the gallows frames and the mills and they're fenced off, and there are several that are open, and you just know it's a mining town. When you go into Virginia City today, other than seeing the dumps, we, we, we just don't have any true remnants of the mining heritage. Mm. Uh, they were all burned down or were 
the steel and the parts were all taken uh, to various other locations over the years. And so, no, it's, it's, it's just a shame that you can't go in and say, oh, my God, what a wonderful mining town. Right. Well, I've been to Butte. I actually went last year, and um, it's it's interesting when you drive around the bend, and all of a sudden you look and you see that the town is built on what looks like strip mining. <laughs> so it's yes. very, it's very obvious that Butte is still uh, you know has some activity going on there. And what I find interesting about these mining towns too is that they're built on the side of mountains like uh, or or large hills like jerome arizona outside sedona or butte yeah you yeah uh-huh. yeah uh-huh. i mean these these places are, are fascinating bisbee, you go down to bisbee arizona yeah yeah mm-hmm. so so when you're in uh in when you're in jerome there's actually the old jail is sliding down the mountain <laughs> So do you have any quirky stuff like that going on? Because, I mean, I'm sure you get lots of exercise in Virginia City, but are there any buildings that are, are kind of traveling on their own? Well, <clears throat> that's an inter- Yes, I'm sure there are. <laughs> um, Virginia City is at uh, 6,250 feet above sea level. And so if you walk around Virginia City on a regular basis, you're either going to be very healthy or die. Uh, (laughs) And, of course, that's one of the things that the tourists run into is that they come from sea level and they start to walk around and go, oh, my, oh, my God, my God, my God. (laughs) But it's estimated that under Virginia City and including Gold Hill, there are six to seven hundred miles of tunnels. Mm. Now, many of those have been backfilled because there was no ore and they did the square set timbering and all of that good stuff. So it's not as if we're on a, 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 the whole town is on a forest underground, but there are sections where truly we are resting uh, on some open ground and the dirt moves downhill. So over the years, there have been buildings that have uh, slipped and um, are not there anymore. I, hopefully that will not happen, but yeah. there's, there isn't probably of the old buildings. There's not a level floor <laughs> in Virginia city. Yeah. It's uh it's interesting to look at, at pictures of it. When you go, I guess the way the streets are, the alphabetized streets are mm-hmm. not, I mean, you could walk down C street and it looks like from the pictures I've seen that you are basically walking fairly level ground through that that whole walk yeah a little slope but nothing that would kill you correct right but if you decide to go down to d street or up to or to, i guess it's down to b street and up to do they go up or down uh actually you you would go from c up to b and to a and then down to d e f g and so on okay i i hear there's no j street is was there a reason for that yeah uh, there isn't and um uh, I'm sure there was a reason, but I don't know what that is. <laughs> I actually started counting on my fingers to see if uh, maybe that was the 13th letter, but it's the 10th letter. So it, uh, I, don't know if, I don't know. I don't know if it has something to do with tens or not. I, I, that stuff like that always uh, in, intrigues me. If we could go back and talk to somebody, huh? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, man, I run into that problem all the time. Um, so one of the most famous residents of Virginia City was Mark Twain. And Mark Twain has a, a quote. I haven't found the exact quote, but it's something to the extent of um, if you get a glass of water and a glass of, of gin, drink the gin and throw out the water. Because the, the water in that area just was not of, of good quality. Do you think that's part of the reason why uh, saloons became so prominent in that area? Well, it's certainly one. Um, water uh, was such a fascinating subject on the Comstock because there was minimal water from the springs uh, that came down. And not only did you need that water uh, and that's why sometimes in the summer you couldn't even prospect back in the day because the water was that scarce. Mm-hmm. So whiskey was a viable substitute in, in the beginning for many reasons, including water wasn't that, uh, that prevalent. But what happened, which is a story in and of itself that gets lost, is that when the big bonanza began and they 
found the, the huge claims in the 1871-72 time frame, they had to get water, more water, uh, because, of course, that processed the ore. And as people were pouring in, they, they couldn't survive. Mm -hmm. And that's where, if you've heard of Marlette Lake, which sits above Lake Tahoe, mm -hmm. we get our water in from Marlette Lake, and that was viewed as the eighth wonder of the world when it was constructed. Mm -hmm. in, in the 1860s, he said, how do we get water to Virginia City? Well, water doesn't run uphill from the Carson River. We don't know what we're going to do. No, we can't get it from, they call it the Sierra. It's actually the Carson Range. Mm -hmm. um, all of a sudden, um, in the early 1870s, they asked again, we've got to get water. And there was a, an engineer, Schuessler, uh, who had done work uh, out of uh, on, on, the, on the West Coast down by San Francisco. He said, we can do this. And from the time he said, we can do this, it was about 18 months, less than two years, that they built uh, both pipe and wooden flume from this lake sitting above Lake Tahoe down across what we call Warshaw Valley, some 20-something miles, um, and brought water into Virginia City. Wow. Man. And it was as viewed to the eighth wonder of the world because um, they used wooden flumes part of the way, and they drilled a tunnel up above the mountains. And then they had to get the water across this valley to Virginia City. So they used uh, iron pipe made in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And the engineering part of this, what made it such a marvel, is that the vertical drop from where they put it in the pipe down to the bottom of the valley and then through centrifugal force, whatever, um, it went up uh, and then into a wooden flume. That was twice what had ever been done in the world. The vertical drop was uh, close to 2,000 feet. Wow. Uh, and the pounds per square inch on the pipe was twice what had ever been engineered in the world. It was something like 450 pounds per square inch, and this was 900. Mm. That's a story that doesn't get told about why Virginia City was such um, the greatest industrial mining center in the world, because things like that were done. You wouldn't find the permit offices to build that today right. in 18 months. Well, and nobody would have wanted to stay if they if there was a water issue all the way through. I mean, there, there would have been no reason to continue a town there. It would have been a boom town just like the rest that just kind of dissolved into history, I would imagine. It had to have water to survive, both from the mining standpoint and processing the ore and from the people standpoint, the, the interesting thing is that they were pumping two and three million gallons of water from the underground mines mm -hmm. each day into the Sutro Tunnel, or that's why the Sutro Tunnel was built. But we had so much water that was arsenic and bad uh. that we couldn't do anything with that screwed up the mines and made it very expensive to, to, to work underground. Um, and no water on top of the ground that we could use. So it was kind of an interesting dichotomy there. Uh, too much water and not enough water. Yeah. But we handled, the, the, my ancestors handled both of those problems. So it's really interesting to me because uh, knowing about how whiskey is made and also knowing that uh, iron is really bad for whiskey. It will turn whiskey black. Um trying to figure out if they were making their own whiskey or if they were bringing whiskey in from other places. And we we're talking about oyster shells and I'm thinking, you know, there's no real sea close by. How are they getting all of these oysters, uh, into, to Virginia city? Well, that's a whole story <laughs> uh, in and of itself. Now there were several breweries, mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, Virginia City. I don't know that they made whiskey on the Comstock. It was it was brought in as far as I know, and of course that was from Pla Plas uh, Placerville and uh, over Carson Pass, and, and that uh, in, prior to the time that the railroad was completed to Virginia City in 1870, and then it became uh, uh, pretty uh, easy. Mm -hmm. um, 
the oyster shells are kind of a fascinating story in and of themselves. When I grew up, there were oyster shells all over. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, they're, uh, people have built some homes up there, and they're, they're not as prevalent. But oysters were um, a symbol of the wealthy. Mm. And the, the miners that were making $4 a day and thought they were rich, by comparison to what they had left on the East Coast, they um, said, well, if oysters are good for those folks that are running the mines, by God, they're good for us. <laughs> so champagne and oysters became kind of a staple. And when the Virginia Hotel opened, uh, well, it burned in 75, and when the bottom floor was opened uh, in I think it was late 76 before the main hotel opened in 77. They called a lot of those, the bars chop houses mm-hmm. and cigar bars. And the first day that they opened, they sold 2,000 oysters. Mm. And so the question is, how did they get them there? Well, <laughs> from what I've read, uh, some came from the West Coast, but they transported them from the East Coast, and they came across by rail, and they were packed in ice and sawdust. Oh, wow. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, Ed, the more I was reading Kelly's book, the more I was like, oyster shells, oyster shells. Wait a second. This isn't San Francisco. <laughs> and and the funny part of it is, uh, Drew, when I grew up and you walked around, as they say, all over where there were houses, um, there were, and, and of course, they didn't have a central dump back in those days. They had the outhouse and they had the stuff they dumped out alongside the, the house. Oyster shells were all over. So let's talk about some of the individual saloons and whether they're still in operation. Were they around uh, and operating before Bonanza came in and and created this uh, this boom? The Piper's Opera House was that always uh, running? And the old corner bar were those still working? No. when you were okay, no. okay. The Opera House, and when I grew up in the forties and the fifties. The, the, the iconic buildings uh, of the Comstock, um, they were quite literally falling apart. And there was a delightful lady who loved the, uh, don't ask me, I remember some of the stuff, but mm-hmm. as far as Pipers is concerned, no, the bar was not open. She would sit up at the entrance to Pipers Opera House with a little uh, tin box mm-hmm. in the summer, and she would charge people 25 cents to walk up into the opera house, anything to pay for a window that was broken, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The the restoration of the opera house, the restoration of the Presbyterian Church, uh, the respira- restoration of the of the Fourth Ward, all of those things did not occur until well into begin to occur well into the fifties and the sixties, and Ron James being a huge part of that because he was able to get the grants. To do the work. Oh wow, he's a story in and of himself. It sounds like is he from there? Uh, yeah, Reno, and uh, <laughs> uh, an Irish folklorist by uh, trade. <laughs> ah, okay. Studied in, I think it was Dublin. Just a delightful gentleman. He and his wife are back in Iowa now, and he continues to do research and, and write books. He not only writes about the West and Virginia City. But, but he's written some other marvelous books. So fascinating personality. If you ever get to talk to him, nice. do it. So the Territorial Enterprise was the newspaper where, I guess this was really Mark Twain's first uh, meandering into it. He had worked around newspapers his whole life, from what I understand. But this was really his first time being a, a journalist is this, um, is any of that still in existence? Well, he came in as Samuel Clemens and before he was Mark Twain and came with his brother who was getting a job with the, before it was, Nevada was a state, I believe. And um, his influence on the Comstock, of course, because he's associated with it is huge. His amount of time on the Comstock mm-hmm. was quite minimal. Mm. But he did write for the Enterprise, and, and, and of course, when there wasn't real news, he made news up that was fascinating. And and so is the building still there that he worked in, or has that uh, was that lost in the fire? That was lost in the fire. Okay. Uh, it was, uh, and it's not where the current Territorial Enterprise 
museum building is. He, uh, and again, Ron James has researched all of this, but uh, the building was a, oh, a block or two away. But yes, he was on the Comstock. Yes, he did go to Gold Hill. Uh, yes, uh, there was supposedly a duel that there was going to take place. And uh, then, of course, he wrote about it and became famous after he left. But, but we have benefited from, yeah. from Samuel Mark being on the Comstock for a couple of years. And so uh, the other bars that you have in the area, uh, Delta Saloon, so I understand, is the uh, longest continually operating bar. This is something I run into in the uh, whiskey industry with distilleries that will say, we're the oldest continuously running, and then you start researching the history and you find out that, well, actually during Prohibition they couldn't produce anything, so they really weren't continuous through that time, but had the longest life. Was was the Delta around when you were, uh, when you were a kid? Oh, the Delta was there. The Warshow Club uh, was changed hands a few times okay but uh, and it, it's still operating the the delta before it was the delta was the smokery mm. and uh, it was operating um, in the 30s and into the 40s and by the petrini family um uh, angelo uh, just sold it a few years ago mm-hmm. so it, it it's changed because they enlarged it and etc uh, etc et but it's still open um the um, Silver Queen, okay, that uh, became the Silver Queen more in the probably the fifties, but it was the Molinelli Hotel, so that bar had been there, uh, and sits almost next to where the International Hotel was. So it's been around a long, long time. Um, so yeah, they've changed hands, but they've been there are several up there. Uh, the Bucket of Blood. Mm-hmm. Um, was the senator at one time, and then uh, the McBride families had that since about 1931. Um, so there are some old timers and some new timers uh, up there. Okay, so and this it was called the senator. The buckets of blood was called senator first before it became buckets of blood. Yeah, back in the, back in the day, and I don't remember the exact history of that, but it had been a bar. Okay, um, before and the same thing with the Delta, which was the smokery. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was there when I was a kid as a smokery. Um, and, um, if you, if, 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 if we walk the street someday, they've changed the names, but it's been a bar for as long as I can remember and long before, for that, okay. some of, some of them that are on the street right now. And it's the buckets of blood where behind that they discovered the, uh, remains under the parking lot of the Boston saloon, which I think is a fascinating story because it shows the different mindset that people had in that day where we think, you know, we think of segregation. I did a story on even Sammy Davis jr. In Las Vegas and how segregation was going on then. But in this town, um, not only were people, um, not so segregated, although you had your particular bars that that attracted a certain clientele. But this this was a uh, a black owned uh, bar that was actually a very high class uh, upscale upscale mm-hmm. bar. Yeah. So uh, did did anybody in the town know about this beforehand? How how did they discover it? I don't know uh, who, who was doing the research. Probably Ron James, because mm. um, uh, and he's been an influence on so many people, uh, in, in, including Kelly. Um, I did not know that the saloon was there um, when I was growing up. It was just the back end of the the bucket of blood. Mm-hmm. And uh, in fact, um, one of the stories that I. I Always, I don't like to make stuff up. It's not on purpose, but I'm sure Ron <laughs> James told me this. Um, there was a black saloon uh, operating uh, down the street from where the Bucket of Blood is on the main street, and the lot is still there. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it actually burned uh, in the fire of 75. But one of Mark Twain's friends that I guess he knew perhaps from from back east, so to speak, as we say out here, mm-hmm. um, was to, uh, ran a black saloon in, in, the, in the early, early days. 
in the 1860s. He actually ran a saloon and, and was a friend of Mark Twain's. Virginia City was both benevolent and and uh, and uh, nasty, uh, all of the same things. Blacks were accepted. Some were Chinese, uh, of course, were had their own area in Virginia City, some two or 3,000 at one time. Uh, so it, a real cross-section, um, a lot of blending and a lot of not blending. Yeah. Uh, Do you think the, uh, because it's really interesting that just the Chinese were had their own section of town. Do you think that's because they just kind of huddled amongst themselves and that just was a comfort thing for them? Or was, it, was that the only segregation that was really going on in the town? I, it was the largest chunk of, 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 of segregation that I know of because they truly did have Chinatown mm-hmm. and was segregated. Now there were certainly Cornish sections of town and Irish sections of town um, and probably Italian sections of town, you know, throughout history in the United States. Yeah. So you got your feet on the ground, you tended to go where people look like you or people talk like you did or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, the, the Irish and, and the Cornish, and they had their, uh, their own military, uh, Siegfield guards and, uh, whatever. Uh, so they, they were somewhat segregated, but yet they also worked underground together. So, um, you better get along with the guy, regardless of where he came from. If, if you're 2000 feet underground, and it's 135 degrees and, Right. Dynamite's going off, black powder's <laughs> going off. You, yeah. you better trust that dude. So going back into the world of saloons, um, I, let's, let's finish on this idea of authenticity in portraying what Virginia City was. Which saloon or set of saloons would you say seem to give off an authentic character more than because we we go to a lot of these these towns will sometimes uh, try to get very kitschy about how they're doing things and they'll try to advance the the lore that we've heard all our lives about what the old west would be like um which one or which ones do you think are best representative of what a saloon might have been like back then well, if you walk in the uh, Warshaw Club, as you as I walk down the street, the Warshaw Club, of course, has been there forever and and uh, was documented, and there are pictures uh, in uh, in um, Kelly's uh, book. Mm-hmm. Um, the Crystal Bar, which was really. Uh, moved out of the Warshaw Club in the 1920s by Bill Marks. That's now the visitor center. But if you walk in there and you look at the bar itself and you look at the chandeliers, that is authentic back from the earliest day. It's not a saloon right now, but if you just walk in to see, you know, the brass rail you could put your foot on and, and, and what was there, and uh, it, it's fascinating. Uh, as you walk down the street, um, the... the um, they were all saloons, so a lot of the furnishings are authentic. Mm-hmm. I don't know that all of the owners know as much about the history of the building as some of us would like them to. But, <laughs> but, but when you would walk in to have a drink, you're walking, you're walking in and putting your arm on a bar that's been there for a long, long time. Okay, and that would be true of the Delta, mm-hmm. um, that and the Bucket of Blood, uh, the, which was the senator before it. Uh, if you go into Connie Carlson's, which is the Silver Queen, put your foot up on the bar. That's been there in one form or another. It was a brass rail for a while. and It's where I took my first steps when I was a little boy. So the story goes. Oh, wow. Learned to walk behind the bar. Nice. Um, Got started uh, early. Yeah, great story. Great story. <laughs> and, and then when you go down to what is now the Red Dog, which used to be the Comstock, that bar is authentic and has been there for forever and ever. So... Um, I'm probably not answering your question, but the buildings are authentic. Most of the bars would be now the Bonanza, for example, that was a service station. Mm. And, uh, my, my Italian cousin, um, made it into the Bonanza club when he realized what Bonanza was doing for Virginia city. So, uh, it's got a great view and it's got a great bar, but it's not an original bar. It was a garage. <laughs> uh, but most of the others, um, are, are, pretty 
authentic. W- one one quick story about uh, just um, the saloons, the bars in Virginia City, the one bit, the two bit. Mm-hmm. When I grew up, uh, you had bartenders and you had mixologists. And bartender was great, and you knew him and all the rest of it. But there were one fellow's name was Drysdale, and that's from he tended bar behind the uh, bar that I have down here in our house that was saved after the fire in 1940. Mm-hmm. He was a mixologist, always had was upscale uh, in terms of the way he treated you. Always had a white shirt on and a, a tie, um, and when you walked in. When you hit the door, it was a martini with two olives or whatever, and it, by the time you sat down, your drink was there. Ah. There were a few that, that took the profession of bartending, saloon keeping, to a different level, and uh, I always found that interesting, and that's probably what was more prevalent in, for example, uh, Pipers and whatever. You, you, you were treated um, as, as, as an upscale patron by a mixologist. Well, it's interesting too, because, uh, if you, in reading some of Mark Twain's writings about saloons, he would talk about the, the fact that if you wanted to, um, meet the most important person in town, it was usually the bartender, not the, not the mayor or not the sheriff. (laughs) Everybody would be gathering there. And, uh, he said, if you really wanted to gain a great reputation, you would become a bartender before you would become anything else because they were the most respected people in town. So, um, yeah, it's interesting to see how, how these things have evolved. And, you know, Virginia city is an interesting case because, uh, it was big enough as a town that there were so many saloons. My research on saloons has basically shown me that in these really small uh, boom towns, the saloon was the first thing to be set up, whether it was just set up on two logs with a, a, a board across them and a, and a barrel so mm-hmm. that they could, you know, from, from that outside a tent all the way to um, it being the place where the stagecoach would let passengers off because it was seen as the center of town. That's right. That's where you went before you went anywhere else. You got your food there. You got your uh, drinks there. You might get some companionship there. It was all in one spot. Yeah, and uh, maybe a little place to sleep. Uh, that's absolutely correct because the the, the barrels of, of, of whiskey were in Virginia City in 1859 after the first discovery Mm. that you could always sell liquor. Yeah. Yes. (laughs) Amazing times. Um, Mm -hmm. well, I really appreciate you sharing all this, uh, this great information with me. And, um, uh, it, it, it's definitely some good stuff to help me, uh, move the story forward. So I I appreciate you. uh, Good. I'm glad you're doing it. Taking the time on that. Thank you, Drew. And, uh, hopefully we'll be in touch. And as I say, when you come west, just give us a call. Will do. All right. Okay. Cheers. Have a great day. Take care. Ron Gallagher. That was a great conversation. I really thank him and, and Amy for setting us up and so that we could have that conversation. I hope you enjoyed all of this backstory on Virginia City. And make sure to head to whiskey-lawyer.com slash interviews and find the show notes for this episode, including a list of some of the great books that Ron mentioned during the show. Whiskey Lore is a production of Travel Fuels Life, LLC. I'm your host, Drew Hanish, and until next time, cheers and slonjava.